We Chinese were the first to invent gunpowder. We were also the first to apply the use of gunpowder to military purposes. Look at this here. This is called the fire arrow cylinder. Inside are 100 fire arrows. On each arrow is tied a gunpowder barrel. Once upon a time, the Chinese led the world in military technology, the crossbow, the compass, and the world's first rocket launcher. But the West has long since left them behind. Since Mao's death, the Chinese army has been in transition, on a long march to modernization. are the People's Armed Police. They are a crack unit who say their role is to combat terrorism. But there are 30,000 of them, and China doesn't have that kind of problem. Unless you call Tibetan monks or student demonstrators terrorists. The fact is, they are used to suppress internal dissidents, what the Chinese call counter-revolutionaries. modern display but this kind of skill costs money and China is a poor country with an army of millions elsewhere the story is different the party has set its sights on modernization on dragging China's agriculture industry technology and its army into the modern age by the year 2000 It's breakfast time in Dezhou. When you look at this street through Western eyes, modernization seems an impossible dream. But it's an even greater problem for the army. Defense has the lowest priority of the four modernizations, and the PLA is determined to update, especially after the debacle the last time they fought a war. These men are on a mine-laying exercise near China's border with Vietnam. Patrols from each side sneak across enemy lines at night to lay mines along supply paths.
This time, it's only practice. Ten years ago, this border saw full-scale war. In February 1979, the PLA launched an all-out assault across the border with Vietnam. The Chinese called it a self-defensive counterattack to teach Vietnam a lesson for invading Cambodia. But the PLA was the one to learn the lesson. I think the short answer to why China's modernizing the PLA is because in the past it's been in such terrible shape. The most obvious case in 1979 where they tried to defeat a small neighbor, Vietnam, and they failed. And for China, that's a deeply embarrassing state of affairs. It was a humiliating defeat for the PLA. They planned to swiftly knock out the Vietnamese border forces and then withdraw in triumph. But after 27 days of fighting, it was the PLA that limped home with a bloodied nose. The Chinese version is, of course, a little different. In 1979, we taught Vietnam a lesson. They had to know that China's territory, borders and sovereignty are not to be violated. The Chinese set out to teach the Vietnamese a lesson by delivering a swift, convincing blow. They didn't do that. They couldn't do that because of the deficiencies and the defects of the Chinese army. They suffered something like 26,000 casualties in the course of three weeks. Soldiers in the Chinese army went without food and water for days because of the backward logistics system. The Chinese realized that they would have to modernize very quickly and across the board in order to uh, rectify these deficiencies. In 1979, when we were fighting, we found it very hard. The worst part of it was that we had no water to drink. For two days and two nights, we had nothing to drink at all. For instance, at one stage, we were surrounded by the enemy. We just kept on advancing and couldn't find any water to drink. The support resources could not follow up. That was the most difficult part. This is Deng Xiaoping, China's paramount leader. He is commander-in-chief of the PLA. It was Deng who demanded modernization of the army after its failure in Vietnam. He attacked the PLA, accusing it of laxity, conceit, bloating, extravagance, inertia, and being too fond of eating. He reduced the army by one million men to save money and improve its efficiency. But this was only part of the problem. The PLA was also technologically backward. This time, their tanks were welcomed in Tiananmen Square, but the hardware was antique. This Beijing crowd has been waiting for hours in the cold. It's not a football game they come to see, but a very different kind of amusement. This is the Asian Dex Defence Exhibition. As well as entertaining the crowd, it's where business is done. Arms dealers from around the world come to buy and sell, and the Chinese get a chance to see some of the best the West has to offer. France, Britain, Italy, the United States have all been eagerly competing for China's cash. This promotional video for French helicopters gives these commanders a tantalizing glimpse of what could be. But for them, it might as well be science fiction. Aircraft like these form the backbone of the world's largest air force. The PLA boasts some 5,300 fighter planes. In the 1950s, they developed a huge industry to make their own planes. But while their numbers have outstripped the rest of the world, their technology has stagnated. 
I think the Air Force is a prime example of the difficulties which the Chinese have encountered in modernization. They have been unable to design and produce an aircraft of their own. The standard aircraft are still the Soviet planes which they acquired in the 1950s. state-of-the-art Western aircraft, the Chinese have been simply unable to afford the massive price tag. Instead, they've settled for buying sophisticated improvements for their existing planes. Their problem is, these aircraft can't fly at night or even when it rains. They lack effective radar, missiles and in-flight refueling. Just about everything a modern Air Force needs. Some experts say that even if these planes could find a target, they'd have difficulty in hitting it. I'm Chen Yao Wu. I joined the Air Force in 1984. I passed a very strict health checkup and the exam. Chen began his basic training like these other pilots. Not with sophisticated electronic gadgetry, but on this simple equipment designed to familiarize them with the pressure and disorientation that their bodies will encounter at high speed. After one year's elementary training, I'm now doing the advanced training. Quite a few people were eliminated during this period, but I'm still here, so I'm really happy. This plane is for coaching, a dummy plane. This is the sight device for determining distances. By adjusting it, you can line up the enemy plane with the dial and calculate precisely the anticipated position of the plane, and the firing range and the angle for the shooting. When you activate these electronic switches, you then open this lid. This is the shooting button. You open it up and shoot down the attacking enemy planes. Well, that's the general idea. Chen's enthusiasm is infectious, but in combat against modern fighters, the fact is he wouldn't stand a chance. Despite the low level of technology, the Air Force is making strenuous efforts to upgrade. The money for this is earned partly through selling large numbers of aircraft to other third world nations. And that's not all they sell. At the Asian Dex Arms Fair, the PLA doesn't only look at other people's weapons, it sells its own wares through various companies like Norinco. Norinco products uh, ranging from small arms uh, to uh, heavy arms uh, like uh, main battle tanks, armored personal carrier, armored infantry fighting vehicles and also their relevant uh, ammunitions and also some anti-tank missiles. Uh, I hope that uh, you can afford it but uh, actually I, I'm sorry that I can't give you the price right now. <laughs> Prices are eagerly discussed if you're a real buyer from the Middle East or anywhere in need of what China has to offer. Business is brisk, and in the last few years, China has become the world's fifth largest exporter of arms. But at the same time, they have cut their own defence spending and the PLA has been told that if it wants more money, it will have to find it elsewhere. The arms industry is hard to beat for earning valuable foreign dollars and Chinese equipment like these armoured personnel carriers comes at bargain basement prices. 
Chinese say their weapons are getting better all the time. The West calls it reverse engineering. In practice, it's simple. Any samples of high-tech weapons they get, they copy. And many of the Azendex displays get the same treatment. It means better sales abroad to pay for better equipment at home. This helps their own plans, such as mechanizing the infantry. But the irony is they only get to use about 20% of the country's arms production. The rest is sold abroad. For now, the PLA must live with its old image as an army in sneakers. Although the idea of self-sufficiency might seem curious for an army, it goes right back to the earliest traditions of the PLA 50 years ago. In the days when the Red Army was blockaded in Yunnan, Mao told them to grow their own food in order to survive. The peasant soldiers took pride in being as effective with agricultural tools as they were with the rifles they stacked beside them. For a modernizing army, this kind of image can be slightly embarrassing. But growing food is still important. It's as much for selling as it is for eating, to help in financing this tank division. The money allotted to the army is not completely enough to meet our needs. So we are developing some light industry to meet that shortage of money. This officer training academy has developed a small factory with civilians. The soldiers make stone trinkets and souvenirs for export. It doesn't stop there. This academy has medicine factories, coal mines and ironworks. A dozen ventures with a thousand employees. It takes 19 PLA officers to run this commercial empire. The soldiers can earn much more money than usual, even more than the official salary of Deng Xiaoping himself. It's good old-fashioned capitalist incentive. This factory pays according to productivity. Whoever works harder gets paid more. There are other incentives as well. An army officer in charge of a business has access to money, influence and power. A surefire cocktail for corruption. The PLA has been told to increase its own financial resources. There are several implications. One is corruption. Second is popular discontent as soldiers compete with civilian vendors. In December last year, Air Force units were using military airplanes to smuggle counterfeit premium quality liquor from Sichuan Yud uh, province to make a huge profit in Xiangyang. China has invented the entrepreneurial army and the PLA takes care of business wherever an opportunity presents itself. has even helped itself to a slice of the tourist industry. From making souvenirs like these, to owning an airline, running helicopter joyrides, restaurants, hotels and coffee shops. The PLA can offer something for even the most jaded tourist. Here, at the International Rifle Range, you can let off steam firing the latest PLA weaponry of your choice. Okay. It's only 30 cents a shot. Perhaps an AK-47 submachine gun is more to your taste. Okay. For a price, there are heavy machine guns. And even full-scale anti-aircraft guns. This group of Japanese businessmen on a three-day tour from Osaka have dropped in on their way from the Great Wall for a bit of relaxation. 
For the discerning marksman, perhaps a rocket-propelled grenade is the answer. At only $150, it's a bargain. There's a savage irony in the secretive PLA inviting once-hated Japanese to handle their latest weaponry. But these days, money talks louder than all kinds of ideology. <laughs> Very accurate. Oh, yes. Very accurate. Okay, happy with that? Right, let's. Does your friend want to. Do you want to have a try with it? There we go. This uh, optical sight, if you tell them, has a times four magnification and enables us to ensure that we get a very high hit probability first time. Okay, could you just ask them if they'd like to have this in the Chinese army? They hit the target every time. The West's eagerness to sell arms to China has been brought to a shuddering halt by the Beijing massacre. The window shopping is over for the PLA, and for the time being, most of their troops will continue to make do with World War II vintage weapons. Here, in southern Guangdong province, these troops are setting up their artillery unit for a combined forces manoeuvre. It's an elaborate exercise, and the only time foreign devils have been allowed to film such an event. Although combining infantry, artillery and the Air Force may be a new development for the PLA, to a modern army it's like a history lesson. But it's a mistake to think that this is all they are capable of. This is a silkworm missile. It's being loaded tentatively onto a fast attack craft. The 
Although the loading may be clumsy, Chinese results are no joke. Hello visitors, I'm the chief engineer at this factory and today I'll tell you something about our factory. Our factory here is a guided missile factory. We manufacture different models of guided missiles for the Navy. This type of guided missile, well it was designed by our factory in the 80s. It is of advanced international standard. Right now, we've started full production to equip our Navy. Export to certain countries has also begun. And it's the export of these missiles that has made the world sit up and take notice. The guidance station is able to guide one, two, three missiles. Through their Asian deck supermarket, the Chinese push their hardware with all the subtlety of a vacuum cleaner salesman. at high altitude with high speed. This missile can intercept not only horizontal maneuverable targets, but also vertical maneuverable targets. developed service to air missile weapon system. It is the first time on show. Am I right? Uh, it is developed to meet the needs of uh, air defense warfare. Modern, I mean modern air defense warfare. Uh, how much it cost? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I will show, ask somebody else uh, who is in charge of uh, the missile. It's not just money, it's a matter of pride, as the general manager of a missile corporation shows senior party officials their latest model. It's all about winning friends and gaining influence. What China has discovered is that it becomes enticing once you've sold arms that perhaps you can gain influence. Perhaps people do take you more seriously. And this is, this is in a sense, a political drug which China has taken and it finds it difficult once it's started to know where to stop. The Chinese have been firing rockets for more than a thousand years. It's no surprise that they can achieve what they want when they set their minds to it. It's made them a competitor in the most advanced military games of all, space and nuclear technology. The Chinese space industry has caused indigestion in the boardrooms of rocket companies around the world. It's about a third cheaper, reliable and until recently was finding eager customers. It's controlled by the PLA, and cancellation of their satellite launch contracts has ruined a potential gold mine for them. Even so, long march rockets like this do have another use. They can be adapted to carry nuclear warheads. No matter whether it's nuclear war or missiles or hydrogen bomb or satellites, in all these aspects we are making fairly good progress. We cannot compare with the Soviet Union, America, England or France, but our weaponry is enough to defend our country. The Chinese have always been very secretive about their nuclear arsenal, but this parade was an exception. The missiles had pride of place. Compared to the Russians and the Americans, it's a mere handful. But these missiles are enough to make them think twice before meddling in China's affairs. First of all, they aimed at the Soviet Union, which so far has been the arch-rival of China. 
And secondly, as far as I know, they have also allocated certain missiles, certain percentage of missiles, at the United States. Launching this rocket into the Pacific, in true Chinese fashion, the PLA were in fact putting Washington and Moscow on notice. They could now reach into their backyard. The great paradox of nuclear weapons is you can't actually use nuclear force. It has never been used since 1945, and so it doesn't really give you much power apart from political power. And that's just what the Chinese are after. As the largest nation in the world, they are determined to be taken seriously. And that means exerting influence in global affairs. For these old veterans, life in the army began with a rifle and a bag of grain. It's a long way from the long march for them and the People's Liberation Army. Sooner or later, the motherland will be peacefully unified. I hope all our fellow countrymen, including our compatriots in Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan, and countrymen residing abroad will together bring about the early arrival of such a day. China regains Hong Kong in 1997 and Macau soon after. For the first time, parts of the sacred motherland will be restored without a shot being fired. China also wants Taiwan back, but Taiwan has other ideas. I think that the threat of an invasion to Taiwan is uh, unimaginable. Uh, militarily, the Chinese would face tremendous problems trying to conquer uh, this uh, floating fortress. But politically, uh, they will have to go completely mad to even contemplate an invasion of Taiwan. Now the policy of our party is not to use force to take Taiwan. Taiwan is a matter of internal policy. In this matter, we must learn from historical lessons from the last thousand years. We don't need to use war to solve problems. But the PLA is flexing its muscles over the distant Spratly Islands. Five other countries claim them, but China wants them enough to have used naval gunpowder to sink Vietnamese ships. Ownership brings control of a vital seaway. We were mainly in the South China Sea on patrol. At that time, the Vietnamese had captured our Spratly Islands. We had territorial rights to drive them out. We were there on patrol. Some say the PLA has the largest and most efficient coastal defense force in the world. Its original task was to protect China's 18,000 kilometer shoreline. But now its role is changing. It is the arm of the PLA best equipped to project power abroad. There have been some clashes already. If other countries continue to invade our islands in the South China Sea, we'll have to resist and fight back. In that case, war will be inevitable and may happen in that area. Destroyer 
is putting to sea for an exercise with another destroyer and several fast attack craft. They have just returned from a five-month tour of duty in the South China Sea. On the bridge, there are two captains, Captain Jin, and with him, the political commissar, Captain Zhou. PLA wants the Navy to be a force in international waters, a blue water Navy. Action in the Spratly Islands is only the beginning. This is one of the most strategic waterways in the world. China is really only exercising a long-stated desire on its part to claim that territory. It should come as no surprise to anyone. The Chinese have made it clear ever since the People's Republic was established that they claim these territories and that they will take it. What we're seeing now is the ability of Chinese forces to take it. As you know, we are a socialist country. Therefore, we want to invade others. But in order to protect our country from invasion, we have to execute a strategy of active defense. For all the combat readiness, there's a folksy feeling aboard these vessels. In some ways, modernization seems just a propaganda slogan. Modernization of the Navy really is based, I think, on an assessment by China that it wants to pursue a more great power status. And all great powers have to have navies. China is not only a continental power, it has a huge Pacific coastline. It has a number of unsettled historical questions which require naval force. The Taiwan problem, the South China Seas problem, both suggest that if China is to get the territory that it wants, to exert the influence that it wants, it has to have naval forces. PLA faces the same problem as all of China, a sea of people but not a lot of technology. Now denied access to Western military hardware, the PLA may be forced to look to the Soviet Union again, or find itself stuck with the image of an army in sneakers, the legacy of Mao. At the same time, it is the world's third largest nuclear power and a competitor for space dollars. Defining the PLA is like trying to hit a moving target. Mao would have been proud of them, growing their corn right up to the control tower. 
But Mao is in the past, and it's a past that the PLA is trying to escape. PLA has outgrown its guerrilla origins and is being transformed to help China take what she sees as her rightful place in the modern world. In the past, China hasn't had the military force to support its objectives. In the 21st century, China will be stronger and more able to pursue its objectives with its neighbors and in contention with the superpowers. That, therefore, must be a source of concern to us all, that China will do what it wants and be able to achieve what it wants in the 21st century. China is not an expansionist power. It has never been an expansionist power uh, historically. And there is no rationale for China to conquer territory. China is developing military power in order to gain political influence, not physical territory. <laughs> undisturbed, lying in silence beneath frigid still waters. Now a team of divers has rediscovered the wreck of the HMS Breadalbane. Join their search for adventure, coming up next.